Mr. Max McCartney. Thank you. So, um, I was a gardener in a leadership development centre. I was growing vegetables for people like you who came on courses. And uh, I'd escaped from London where I'd been keeping bad company. And the firm, as they were known, were after me. And so I needed to put as many miles as I could between the firm and me. And I ended up in North Wales and trained as a gardener and took on this job as head gardener in this leadership development centre. Uh, in the space of 24 hours, I became a management consultant when I intervened in a fight between two executives from a large um, retail company. Uh, I was just in the garden and these two guys started fighting. I intervened and sat them down and uh, actually it was outside the garden in a river gorge nearby and I said to them, um, we have a choice, I think, or rather you have a choice. Uh, we could either just go back to the leadership centre and, and uh, you'll have to go home and I don't think it's going to work too well for your careers, or we could sit down here and we could have a conversation about how this ridiculous episode evolved and where were the points where with some rather more intelligent thinking we might have been able to have traversed a different path and who knows we might even learn something and I understand that you are here to learn so maybe we could drag something worthwhile out of this rather silly and actually not particularly impressive fight. So uh, they, not surprisingly they took the, the option to sit down and we did that and we got back to the centre and overnight I was dragged out of the garden and, and became a management consultant. And a few years later started my own business in the UK, then in Poland and Russia. And um, so I suppose, I, I, I think I'm just trying to justify why I'm stood on this stage because I suppose I am some kind of entrepreneur. Until the day came that one of the businesses I was working with, uh, who'd given me this brief, they said, the rest of the Lloyds of London insurance market is going down the drain. Names are losing fortunes. Money is just hosing out of our business. And this very small business said, we believe that out of this uh, bonfire, we think we could be the phoenix that arises. But when that day comes that we make our fortune, We'd like to be able to put our hand on our hearts and say we did it with our values intact with integrity. And so I worked with that company for that five year period. They sold it to Warren Buffett and they came out with millions and millions and millions of pounds. And the guy said to me, he said, uh, I wanted to thank you. Um, we have paid you for your services, but I'd like to give you something a bit more do you have a dream? And I said, yes, it's a valley that I saw in my imagination some decades ago where we would explore what it really means to be human at this time. And he said, what do you need? I said, I need the valley. So he pulled out his checkbook and he wrote the check that bought 50 acres of Devon in some of England's most beautiful countryside and that is Embercombe. So, the context for our conference. I think we have a huge challenge. We sit with a huge challenge right now. We can't quite bring ourselves, and I think it is a choice, bring ourselves to understand the situation that we are in now. It has been said in this conference, and I think uh, many others, that we are rational beings. I think that's absolutely ridiculous. We are entirely irrational. We have been having, science has delivered us information over decades now, informing us of what we are doing to this planet, 
and we have walked straight past it. We are now, of course, notionally getting to grips with it. But if we, for instance, consider the fact that half of the CO2 that's in the atmosphere at the moment has been put there in the last three decades and is still being pumped in at a colossal rate. If we consider for a moment the fact that in spite of, and it is amazing and, and extraordinary, the efforts on many businesses around the world to really take on sustainability, the fact is that the situation is getting worse, it is not getting better currently. We have a situation where our soil fertility is collapsing. The study at Sheffield University that said 100 harvests left from the UN then downgraded to 60 harvests. I'm speaking about Britain, but it's happening all kinds of places. We have a situation where our seas, you know, at the moment it's all about plastic in the UK, I'm not sure how it is here, but we know that we are collapsing species on species. We know that we're in the sixth mass extinction of species, 150 to 200 going down every single day species. We know that California is right now, sort of, the fires have not stopped. We know the Amazon, the fires have not stopped. And a book that came out this year called The Uninhabitable Earth by the uh, deputy editor of the New York Times saying he begins with the words, it is much, much worse than you think. Uh, it's an incredible situation. But you see, we can't quite manage it. We can't quite take it in. So we, we do what we've always done, which is sort of take it on a little bit, and then, but meanwhile we plan as if it's the same world. It is not the same world. We say that we love our children. The evidence does not support that statement. I would I love you just to let that sink in a little bit. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, some years ago, before he died at the hands of the Nazis, a pastor and a dissident, anti-Nazi dissident, the ultimate test of a moral society is the kind of world it leaves its children. Well, the children are beginning to speak, aren't they? I was stood with some of those children in Trafalgar Square just recently in the last Extinction Rebellion thing. The children are getting pretty upset. The children, the young people, are looking at many of us, certainly people of my generation, but not only my generation, some younger as well who in pursuit of the businesses and in pursuit of the various things that they are engaged in are rapidly doing a lot of harm to the future of those same young people. You see, leadership is a choice. And talking about the kind of leadership, real, true leadership, is a choice. Leadership as it were, comes to a person when you care enough to actually do something about it that is in line with a vision and values that is greater than yourself and your own ambitions but is part of what you're going to give to the well-being and welfare of the future. You see, we haven't even asked the first question. And the first question the Kogi Indians would say is what is the purpose of a human life? I don't remember hearing that question any time in my education. Not in the primary school, not in the secondary school, and certainly not during university, and absolutely not in any business school that I've ever visited. What is the purpose of a human life? Now, if you ask the Kogi, what is the purpose of a human life? And you were something like any of the ages of the present here in this room, they would be shocked and stunned by the question. They would be consternated, they would be really worried. 
and they would be looking at you and trying to work out whether you are of sound mind. Because you see, they teach their three-year-olds what is the purpose of a human life. And eventually, let's imagine you engage this question with them, they, they, they would move to compassion and they would, they would take you close and perhaps they'd hold your hand and then they'd whisper into your ear the purpose of a human life is to care for all living things with us. I asked myself what would happen if this room full of entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs to be were to say that the purpose of their enterprise would be in direct relation to that purpose for us as humans to care for all living things and since for the Coggy everything is living that means to care for everything. We stand at this extraordinary time. Personally I am really excited. I am so joyfully happy to be alive at this time and have the choice to try to do something about it. To do everything in my power to walk towards the things that I find truly frightening if those same things mean that I might be able to add a little bit more to the opportunities of those that will come after me. I'm speaking to you now on this platform and I, I think I've spoken at four different events uh, a business event with the music industry in Amsterdam just recently, a uh, head, head teachers event in London just recently, the um, IT um, Internet of Things team with Vodafone just recently, on the Danone advisory board just recently, but the truth is that only 15 years ago, and I'm in my 70s now, only 15 years ago, if you had asked me what is the one thing that would terrify me and I would never do voluntarily, then it is to speak in public. And it is those Native Americans who stood in front of me and said, we have known you long enough to know that you love our Mother Earth. So we say to you, Mac, you have to get over your fear and you've got to speak about the things that really, truly matter. I said, well, I I understand that would be a really great thing to do, but I'm, I'm frightened. We said, they said, we don't care. I said, yes, but I, you know, I might not be able to speak. They said, we, we really don't care. I might cry. And they said, well, that would be really quite impressive. Nobody would leave that conference, as it were, untouched by your presence. You, yeah, so let's just imagine that for a moment. You could stand on the stage and you could start weeping. And if you kept it up for 40 minutes, you know, by the time everyone leaves, you will have made a profound impression. I was staring at them saying, no. There was... So, I promised them. And the first speaking engagement I did was a music festival in Britain. As I figured, what is the place where nobody will really care too much, probably because they're so stoned that they won't even quite take it in. And I thought music festival, so I found a teepee and I gave my first talk. And three people turned up to that talk. One of them was asleep. And the other two were in the early stages of having sex. <laughs> By the time I finished my talk, the first one was still asleep. And the other two were in the latter stages of having sex. I considered it a success. It was like a sort of metronome, drumbeat, to my talk. So I, we tried to sort of rise together to the occasion and deliver something of real impact. The second time I spoke, I'd been to India. In India, I love India, I had a wonderful time there, but I did eat something I shouldn't have done. So every 10 minutes through my talk, I had to rush out of the yurt this time, I think it wasn't a teepee, rush out of the yurt, go to the bushes, make a deposit, come back and continue the talk. And I haven't stopped, of course, and it has got easier. But it is never actually without risk and it is never completely easy because if you're going to stand and speak to people about what's in your heart, 
and that you do not actually feel fully resourced to do and that you feel that you do not have all the knowledge you would like to have and that you wish you had certain skills more than you have and you're not even quite sure whether you're going to find the words to put to articulate what is in your heart out and find a way to share it well then it is always a bit frightening so I think it is quite similar to people who are considering the possibility of being entrepreneurs but do we need more entrepreneurs see my question my thoughts on this are we do not need more entrepreneurs that are as it were, fully in the mould of entrepreneur, most entrepreneurs' past. We need something different. We need people in service to the world and not just the human world either. We need courageous leaders with great imagination. We need extraordinary people who are at heart ordinary people. Because the people I'm speaking about do not actually think that they're extraordinary. It's just that they are extraordinary because they're taking that stand. We need people determined. That they will bring everything that they have and discover the kind of human being that they are in the process as they go along. Those Native Americans say, we would never trust any leader who was not walking the twin trail. The twin trail is the inner path of your own self-unfolding, self-becoming, self-healing, self-actualization as a human being. And the outer path is the path of having powerful effect in the world. You do not do the inner path first and the outer path second, they said, because you will never finish the inner one. It is always work ongoing. You are always work in progress. No, you say, I will do these two things simultaneously, like the double helix, like the wand of Caduceus. You do these two things together and you never stop. I met with the Tuhoi Maori in New Zealand in March. And we were discussing retirement. And I was asking, do they have that concept in their, in their people? And this, this, Guy just starts laughing. He says, yes, we do. We, 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 we actually, we understand retirement, but we do it at a different time to you. We retire our people between 15 and 30. He said, they're useless. Uh, forgive me, anyone who's been 15 and 30. He said, they're useless. He said, they have to go off and do stuff. They get into all kinds of trouble. They make all kinds of, you know, all, it, mayhem is what our 15 to 30 year olds do. But when they come back, we say now you, as it were, burnt off the first third of the rocket fuel that's inside you and you're beginning to get a sense of who you are now. You are in service. And when they're my age, when they're 70 odd, then apparently we're meant to be in our full power. And that we do not ever consider stopping until we drop. Since I have, at this rather ripe age, a two-and-a-half-year-old child who looks at me and in his sweetness, in his wonder as a little two-and-a-half-year-old, I feel and I know that he trusts me and it would collapse my whole sense of the person and human that I am if I was not in some reasonable manner worthy of that trust. This is the biggest time that there's ever been in our human story. I, I don't know how else to say it. So let me share with you this piece. Quite a long time ago now, I sat with those uh, those people who are teaching me, these Native American people, they said, you know, long time ago, we asked the question, how shall we govern our people? Because we had become aware, even then, that when 
leaders are elected or selected and take their seat in the council, women and men. They obviously have some sense of pride of sitting in that seat. They are in some way respected and looked up to. They have, they have taken the seat as a council chief. But we have noticed that even the best individuals over time begin to get rather used to being a chief and begin to make laws and take decisions that favour rather more the interests of the chiefs than the people that they serve. It's a human thing, they said. So we asked ourselves, what can we do? And by the way, I am speaking to you now as chiefs, you see. You may not think of yourself as a chief, but you are in the 1% of the 1% of this whole world's most privileged people. You are people that have the power to make a difference. You are people that are educated. You are people who have all kinds of means at your disposal. Even though you do not, some of you probably feel ready or ever will. But those are the people that you, you are. He said, how shall we deal with this? And we came up with this idea. Every time the Council of Chiefs, chiefs gather, we will light a little fire at the centre of the circle and we will call this the children's fire. And every chief will have to make a pledge to the children's fire. No law, no decision, no action, nothing of any kind will be permitted to go out from this circle of chiefs that will harm the children. No law, no decision, no action, nothing of any kind will be permitted to go out from the circle of chiefs that will harm the children. And they didn't just mean human. They meant the young of all kind. It's basically a pledge to life. And then they asked me would I take this and speak it to business audiences. And once again, I found myself in conversation with me saying things like, rather unconvincingly, I'm not sure if business audiences were particularly interested in this fragment of this ancient wisdom. They said, we don't care. So we started going down that road again. Well, it's not worth it. Okay. So the first time I met an audience similar size to you in London, and I spoke about the children's fire. And the guy sat next to me was the ex-sustainability director for one of the big oil companies. And I could feel him getting really nervous as I was speaking, because he'd never met me before and he hadn't really asked properly what I was going to talk about. So I was waxing lyrical and getting into the, my, my stride with this idea about the children's fire. He's beginning to twitch. And at a certain point I said to the audience, I said, can you imagine can you imagine what we could do around the world if in all institutions of power we were to require our directors, our chiefs, our lawmakers, our governments, our religious hierarchies, our uh, university professors, our every kind of body influence of power. Can you imagine what we could do were we to require them to take the pledge of the children's fire before they take their seat? and that they would have to act in accordance with that at the most deep and profound level. Can you imagine the impact we would have? Every board of directors. Anyway, there was a long silence. And then I asked the question, what kind of society is it? What kind of species is it that would not take the pledge of the children's fire? Because you see, foxes, deer, bears, they all abide by the children's fire. They will do anything to protect their young. They will do everything in full sacrifice for those same young. Anyway, this guy on my right, at this point there was another long silence and I thought to myself, well, that's, that's good, I'll, I'll let the silence continue. So it continued, and it continued, and suddenly he couldn't stand it anymore, and he leapt to his feet, and he didn't mean to, but he went like that with his hand and knocked me back into my seat. So I went, woof, back in the seat. And he said, don't worry, ladies and gentlemen, 
as right now we're going to do some important work. And the voice at the back of the room called out, Why don't you sit down? This room is full of grief and unshed tears. Why don't you sit down and let this silence continue? It was a long silence. Like now, he's peering into the audience. The lights are in his eyes. He can't see who spoke. He says, well, if, if, if everybody thinks so, complete silence. He sits down. They stood up again. Can you imagine what we could do? Were we individually and collectively brave enough to take a pledge to the children's fire? Which, by the way, in this instance would mean that every entrepreneur who's creating businesses would ask themselves the question first. What is, is there any harm shifting outwards from this business? In, my, in, in the way that I source my materials, in the way that I, in every, can you imagine that, 360 degrees, every single way. It doesn't just mean, you know, I'm producing food, so that's good. Yes, where does it come from? What is it? What's involved in the packaging? The whole thing. What kind of society, what kind of species is it that would not take the children's fire? Especially when all the information you could ever have asked is written on the walls all around you and is saying, continue on this path. And you might as well take a gun to the child that you love. For there is no future fit for purpose for them or those places. The question was asked, Raphael asked, do you like nature? We are nature seem to have forgotten that. In other words, do you like yourself? The evidence would be that we are a species that is self-harming and that seems to have lost the desire to take their place in the seat of things, in the family of things on this earth. Yet, there are extraordinary people about doing extraordinary things. And it is my prayer and hope you see and a big chunk of those people are sat right here today. Because, as I understood and from previous talks, we are talking about people that love adventures, aren't we? We're talking about people that like challenges. We're talking about people who will never give up. We're talking about people that have imagination. We are talking about all kinds of incredible qualities. Well, that is what is called for now because we have to start singing a new song. We have to start doing something truly incredible. We have to start serving a purpose that is at least close to what the Kogi Indians suggested. Now that I'm warm to my theme, I have a lot of things that I would love to share to you, but I've got a feeling that time is probably beginning to run out. Well, we have some time. Okay. Well, let me just give you this. I was invited, I have been invited to go and take groups of executives to meet people who are generally recognised as people that have had profound experiences and to share their knowledge. So we, there was talk of Nelson Mandela. I took a group to meet uh, under the auspices of a wonderful organisation called Leaders Quest, who are based in India, London and New York, to take this group of executives to meet Mac Maharaj, who are long, also with Albie Sachs, who are two of the people who were um, well known to Mandela, in fact Mac Maharaj, I think, in prison with him. We went to see this guy because Mac Maharaj was a uh, leader of the ANC forces on the ground in the bush. He was the one who was detailing and sending off his people on missions from which very often they never came back. He was the one who made decisions that if they were wrong in any way might well result in those same people that he sent off being in the cells and tortured 
and treated abominably whose screams would have reverberated out across the place. He is that person. We asked him, in all your time as a leader where your decisions really count, what would you say is the single most important attribute that you would look for in a deputy of yours? And he said, well, first I want you to answer that question yourselves and I'd like you to write it down. And we did that. And he said, now I will answer you. The answer for me, he said, is self. And I'm, I would bet quite a lot of money that everybody thought he was going to say self-confidence. He said self-doubt. I have not heard this too often in leadership lectures. He said, self-doubt, I have had it up to here, he said, with leaders who have no self-doubt, leaders who have no questions, leaders who are, uh, only uh, speak and never listen, leaders who have no interest in anything, and it's come out of their mouth, in which case they think it must be brilliant. Leaders without self-doubt, he said, are profoundly dangerous people. I had such a leader. And over time, I suddenly began, I realized that he was dangerous because he had no self-doubt and many of my soldiers lost their lives on the back of that. This is the complexity of the time we live in, you see. These, these assertions of all the usual stories about self-confidence, this and that and that and that, you know, yes. Fine, but of course you need self-confidence, but you need, it's more complex than that. You need to be able and willing to look at these things in some depth. And from that, make not clever decisions, but wise decisions. And there is a notion separating those two things. There are three questions that I would offer any leader. The first one is, what is it that you most deeply and profoundly love? This is not a question to be done in a one-hour workshop, okay, or, or, or whatever. This is an ongoing question that you can hold before you for as long as you live, because it does shift and move as you go through time. The really key bit is deeply and profoundly love. When you have answered that question to the very depth of your soul, as it were, you will have defined what is sacred. And then, you see, you are asked to stand by that and, and protect it and live for it. That is the flag that flies above you. You have defined what is sacred to you by answering that question, what it is that we deeply and profoundly love. To betray that would be the most appalling feeling because you would have known that you, are, you, you have no worth, basically. The second question, what are your deepest and most profound gifts? Your gifts are not the same as your qualifications or indeed your experience, though both are useful. And, it, and, and some of us might even wonder, what do I have innate gifts? Well, it's an indigenous concept. And they, they were saying to me that when, you know, when a, 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 the fetus is in the mother's womb, as it were, creation whispers to that fetus, I'm going to give you a gift. I'm going to lodge it somewhere deep inside your gut. And when you are born, your journey is to discover that gift. Grow it, bring it to its fullness, and then generously share it. It's a good hypothesis to work from. It says there is no single human being without value. And many of us actually have a rather low opinion of ourselves, even though we create a, a front and some bravado and all the rest of it. But the truth of the matter is that many of us do not actually think that we're so extraordinary and amazing, thank goodness. To know what your gifts are, that should be where your work is centered. But take my example around speaking, you know, it has not been an obvious or easy journey. I would implore you 
build your businesses around your gifts. You will shine, you will be successful, but that's not, for me, particularly important. You will deliver something of true value, authentic and profound, and that is wonderful. Third question, what are your deepest, the most profound responsibilities? Love, gifts, responsibilities. My little two and a half year old I've spoken of, I love him with all my heart, of course I do. That's why I'm leaving early, because I've been away for two weeks. I need to be back home so that I'm in bed tomorrow morning, so that when he wakes up, I'm there. So I love him, you see, but do I love yours? Do I consider myself responsible for yours? Do I consider myself in any way responsible for the screams and terror that is issuing out of the Yemen and Syria and so many parts of our world? Do I care for the tribes that are being systematically decimated and destroyed in the, in the Amazon by a president that, that actually said that he wished his own military were as efficient in killing the natives as the, as the North American forces were in the States a century or two ago? We need to understand, I would say, we have our personal responsibilities and then we should hold those very close. But we have wider responsibilities and we should regard them with equal dedication. This is the most extraordinary, amazing time to be alive. And I will so happy that at the moment I seem to be still in good health as I will continue to do everything I can during the time that I have. But you, like me, have no idea how much time you have, you see. You've, you imagine that you have lots. But a few years ago I was told I had a brain tumour. And then they told me I didn't. Which was rather strange. And then I went to the hospital and they said, you're absolutely clear, you're fine, there's no problem. I got in the car halfway down the road home on the M5 motorway in the southwest of England, a car hits us from behind doing 120 odd miles an hour and our car is just going <laughs> down the centre of the motorway with cars going <laughs> smashing into the central reservation, the cars are right off and later that evening we got the train home. We were so close. We do not know how much time we have. So make your five-year plans, do your things, but live now. Now, now, now. And I would say, joy will fill you, because you will have self-respect, and you will feel good, and many will benefit. Thank you very much.